Hello. Uh, welcome. This is our first uh, series in Branching Out. I'm Alex Miller. I'm the marketing and... Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm the marketing uh, and social media manager at Tree People. And I just wanted to give a little background on the series that we're doing. We're going to be interviewing people from around the country and hopefully the world about how they manage forests and how they manage trees. Um, it should be pretty exciting. It's uh, it's just a, it's the whole goal is to see what we have in common and what are the specific issues like right here at our park. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get into some stuff, but I'm I'm actually at Tree People's Park. Um, we're, and we're we're still closed right now, but we will we will uh, soon be. I'm, I'm going to we're, we're do, okay. <laughs> we'll we'll be open uh, uh, hopefully soon. Um, so I'm going to our our first one is with the uh, City of Oakland Park. And we are going to have David A. Bear, and so I am going to have them join us right now. While they're joining, um, I want to let you know that we have a learn at home experience, uh, a learn at home in an hour. Hi, David. Hey, Alex. How you doing? Nice to see you. Nice to Good meet to you. Good to see you, brother. Yeah. What's going on? What's going on is where I'm just I'm up, I'm up here at our park um, in in nature. And nice, huh? We've got a nice yurt village. Uh, this is where our offices are. So I decided to come up here today to, to interview you. Lucky you. Yeah. We had an outdoor barbecue today for staff to thank them for all the work they've been doing during the pandemic. So I got to give away the uh, frozen candy bars. That's yeah, right. <laughs> I figured if, if it's the only way I could get popular, it works for me, right? Yeah. So great. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, we've got, we, I just wanted to, I guess we can just jump right in. Um, Hit and me. Yeah, so t tell me what, uh, what you guys have going on right there. Um, yeah, totally. Well, let me tell you, you first a little, little bit about us. Park? Yeah, yeah, totally, I can. Um, so Oakland Park is sort of a forgotten about little urban pocket uh, that's mostly surrounded by Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we are three miles from the beach and about three miles from 95 which is the major highway that runs all the way up the East Coast, just like you guys have Highway 1 in California. Um, so a lot of people drive through our city. Uh, and because one of the major corridors is called Oakland Park Boulevard, a lot of people don't even know we're a separate city. I talked to somebody yesterday, uh, actually the guy that was cutting my hair. And he's like, you know, so what do you do? I'm like, yeah, I'm the manager of Oakland Park. He said, is that a city? And I, and I was three miles <laughs> from our city line. So people think of us as greater Fort Lauderdale, but we really are a warehouse sort of oriented, um, lower middle class uh, residential area. Um, and it's really cool, Alex, because when I started here seven years ago, uh, I figured, you know what? This place has got no place to go but up. So there, there's nothing to lose by going to work here. I have had so much fun. Um, we right now have uh, a lot of things moving in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, and a lot of it we've already um, accomplished. Uh, I, I grew up in Minnesota, in a small town in Minnesota. And uh, even though I lived in the town and most people were farmers, at that time, every street had a tree canopy. Um, the problem was most of the trees were Dutch elms. And Dutch elm disease struck our town. And we went from having this gorgeous green space to having stumps of the remainder of the tree trunks. So, you know, I'm kind of passionate about nature and about returning us to a time and a place that is more conducive to livability. Um, and that's hard to do when you're in an urban setting, you know? I mean, so let's, so let's talk about some of the trees. Um, like, yeah. So I, I, I guess, what are, your, what are your goals for your urban forestry in Oakland Park? So from the beginning of my tenure here, I made a commitment to put aside money annually for the replenishment of our tree canopy. In an urban area that's pretty well completely built out, that's really hard to do. Um, but if you're creative and you use the right native 
trees and plants, you can both be resilient and add canopy. So we find areas as small as like the medians in some of our roadways to yep. add the tree canopy. And it's always weather contingent because I unfortunately live like you guys do in an area that is seeing more and more natural calamities because of what's happening with our broader environment. Um, and again, this year they're predicting a really extreme hurricane season, which if those come through are gonna take a real toll on our tree canopy as well. Um, but we have done creative things like uh, we negotiated with the school district where they've got a school bus uh, depot. Uh, they run a large number of their buses out of that operation. And they had a large section of it that was just vacant, forgotten about property. Um, and we negotiated a long-term lease for five acres of that property. And we turned it into a nature trail. And we That's added- fantastic. And we added all of this tree canopy and it was right adjoining one of our city parks. So we did an entire tree canopy line, native trees only, all the way around the perimeter. So you can't even see any yellow buses anymore, even though they're parked just 10 feet away from the fence. And you go in there and it's like you're in an entirely different world than what the rest of Oakland Park or Fort Lauderdale look like. We have two major developments, one on an old golf course uh, and another an old Kmart site that are being developed as we speak. And both of them, we negotiated with the developers in order for them to get approval that they needed to designate open space along the perimeter of their properties that were going to be accessible to the public and were going to include native landscaping and trees. And those two projects alone are going to add 25 acres of new open space and tree canopy areas for our city. So it's like That's fantastic. you find yeah. pockets, you know, you find it's, it's sometimes, Alex, the world is a series of small successes rather than grand schemes. You know what I mean? My most, my favorite project right now is that we have a public works building that is probably from the 1950s, 1960s, pretty dilapidated. We've got a, a, a fuel station there for our uh, city vehicles, uh, and we use it primarily as a parking lot. Um, and we had an old uh, water treatment plant, which was taken out of service probably three decades ago. Um, and we decided we were going to demolish it and then build a new public works building on that location so that we can tear down the existing public works building and create a park space. So we've got an additional seven acres of property that we're going to be adding to parks here in the center of our city, which is also the traditional African-American area of our city. You know, people in California have the luxury of not having the same traumatic history of the struggle for civil rights that the people in the South do. And you know, I have to tell you, I lived in New York for 15 years or so, and I really didn't understand what the South was all about. And especially since I would fly down to Florida, you know, this time of year, get out of the cold a little bit, enjoy the beach a little bit. I never realized that South Florida is just as Southern as Alabama or Mississippi. And there's a railroad track that was built to bring the Northerners down to the East Coast of Florida many, many decades ago. And uh, that railroad track very literally became the demarcation point for where the Blacks were required to live. And this new area that we're gonna be designating as a park area with an urban forest component with native trees is right in the heart of that area that not only has been ignored by government, but when government used to pay attention to that area, it was to put additional burdens and restrictions on them. And that's where we're going to put our library. We're going to move the city library from the east, the traditional white area of the city on the east side of the tracks, right over there to the other side of the tracks. And we're going to put our our, our warehouse repository of knowledge, where it belongs and where people need it, 
right in the middle of our urban forest. So this is a social justice effort, as well as an environmental return to livability approach. A lot of environmental justice is essentially social justice at its core, because we find that in Los Angeles, these red line districts, we find are, have power plants, have pollution, yep. and are, they're all around communities of color or uh, communities that are uh, impoverished. So it, the city, and, and you look at the canopy coverage, and we, we, ha we had a talk on urban heat, uh, and we've got another tree talk coming up about urban heat. It is the largest weather-related killer. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it, uh, it, it's, it's a very, it, it's good to hear that you're using, you're acknowledging a problem and you're, you're using both trees and education to help solve it. Because the libraries at the end are, that, that's our culture. Is Absolutely. How you, that's how we spread it to the next generation. Um, what, what are the specific trees that you're planting? What well, are the native trees? Uh, so the, one of the great scourges of what happened in South Florida actually was that, um, and I think this has happened a lot in California as well, is that people developed a sort of romantic concept about palm trees. Yep. And we, <laughs> we right? only have one that's native to. Hey, California and the yet, same, or... and the same thing here, and yet it has become this dream vision of what it means to think Miami or Fort Lauderdale, and that that has spilled over to other invasive species and non-native species, and that has created a real challenge for us to try to find the kind of drought resistant um, plants that are native and can actually grow here. Interesting. Um, so you, you guys deal with drought. Oh. Well, what happens to us frequently is not unusual in comparison with what happens to you. Yeah. Perhaps the big difference is that we are probably more humid and you're more dry. But the fact of the matter is Florida regularly goes through an extremely dry season, which we're in the middle of right now. And this time of year, there's virtually no rain. And as a consequence, the plants need to be able to survive, not just during our rainy season, just like you should have a rainy season. I know you've missed a couple <laughs> recently. But yeah. our plants need to be resilient enough to survive really heavy downpours, as well as three, four, even five months of almost no rain. So we need to get back to a time and a place. Slash pines used to proliferate all over this part of the country. In fact, if you go back to the houses that were built in the early 1900s here, they're almost always built of native pine. Um, and you find almost none of that anymore. And you know, I, I told you I was from Minnesota, so you know where my heart is when it comes to pine trees. And they're native here, but you hardly ever see them. So those are the kinds of trees that we're looking at replenishing. And we won't plant anything that's not native. We won't plant anything that isn't resilient to this kind of dramatic change in the weather. And we have to protect it. We can't just plant it just because it's resilient and walk away because those hurricanes are brutal. And we need to safeguard those trees until they root themselves sufficiently so that they can survive and withstand those, uh, those hurricane events. That's uh, so fantastic to hear. So tr uh, a big thing about tree people is that we, when we plant, it's a three to five year commitment. Yeah, that we totally. are And then we're stewarding the land, we're removing. But one of the big problems we have here is, I don't, I don't know if you have the, this image of the golden hills of California, um, that's an invasive mustard. It's a Spanish mustard that is an invasive that we have to, that is a huge issue for wildfires. Yeah, totally. So we, we're, we're constantly having to uh, clear the, clear the land and it's, it, it's, it's a big, it's a big hassle, but it's, it's, it's part of our stewardship of what we do when we, no question. when we plant in the forest. And th so you mentioned drought, what other, um, issues what other ecological impacts are like what are what are you concerned about when you're planting trees um 
most of what we're concerned about is, I think, just making sure that they're going to sustain themselves. So okay. it, it just takes, like you say, a lot of commitment to say, um, check in on them, make sure they're watered frequently at the beginning, make sure that they're buttressed so that they're going to be able to withstand unusual circumstances. We had a pretty serious flooding issue here last November. Um, and we haven't had that for quite a while. Um, but we're seeing the same thing happening on this side of our country as you're seeing on that side of the country and throughout the world. And that is with the sea level rises, the water table rises. Uh, and what ends up happening to us is that we're only three miles from the coast. So even though we don't have beachfront property, we definitely get tidal impacts. And those king tides that come through in October really cause serious problems. And for a three week run in November, uh, we had so much rain that we literally had cars stranded in our streets um, because they just couldn't move, they were underwater. Um, and we have not seen that happening in our city for probably 20 years because we invested tens of millions of dollars on our stormwater infrastructure but eventually, Alex, as you know, water needs to go someplace. I mean, this is, this is we're not talking about like, you know, uh, subatomic particles and, you know, nuclear fission or anything like that. We're talking about Newtonian, when the apple drops from the tree, it falls on your head. And water's the same way. We're in a gully here. And so the impact that that has on trees and tree survival is really a critical element for us to keep in mind because that's going to keep happening. And unfortunately, it's going to happen even more frequently than it has in the past. We have some really creative strategies on what to do. There's a new group, uh, not real new, but a group uh, called the uh, Alliance for National Community Resiliency. And that effort is all about asking individual cities like our small city, 50,000 people, to really reflect on what the challenges are that they may be facing and how to protect the investment that they've made here. That's not just infrastructure inside or under the ground or even just the buildings, but it's about people, it's about livability, it's about nature, it's about making sure that we're protecting everything that makes Oakland Park what it is. So I think that's our biggest single challenge is that it's related to things that are really, again, so big. But if you take a little piece of it and you say to yourselves, what are we going to be able to do about this, right? What are you going to do about this vacant piece of property? What are you going to do about this development? What are you going to do to improve people's lives? We've given away over 5,000 native trees to our citizens. And we've That's shown fantastic. them where they have to be planted in order to make sure that they're not going to interfere with the overhead uh, electrical wires and how they need to be sustained. We have training periods. We have a great not-for-profit group that's located in one of our city buildings called the Urban Farming Institute. And we spend extra money to keep on staff here a city horticulturist. I mean, we're a city with 50,000 people. how you're paying for this? You know, it's funny. That is such a funny question. I, I have long believed that too many people start with the question, how much is it going to cost? Yeah. Because if you start with the question, what do I want to accomplish? You find ways to get the money. Our city is below the median average income. Our city is at the bottom of the list of municipalities in our county, Broward County, which is a fairly wealthy county. That's where Fort Lauderdale is. Um, and we're at the bottom of the list when it comes to the amount of millage that we charge our citizens you come up with creative solutions. We get a lot of grants from places. We get a lot of donations. We're really, really aggressive in trying to find creative partnerships. That's so- like, It sounds like you're, you're absolutely committed and you've made these financial investments into, 
it, it, that's real. It's a real cost of operating and, and maintaining trees. Is but, but Alex, it's just oh, like but it, it pays for itself. Beyond. You got it, exactly. And you know what the reality is? Every single year, and I know we've got a hot real estate market right now. I totally get that. But our property appreciation, because of what we're doing to make this a more livable place, is really returning that investment to our citizens. When we do a development, we make sure that we are getting them to commit to the same strategies that we're committed to ourselves. I've got a project right now that we're talking to the community about making a plan for where we're going to literally develop property around our city hall building. And the reason we can develop that property is because we owned, the city owned, two vacant pieces of property that were polluted, again, on the west side of the track. And we worked really hard to find a developer who wanted to help us build on those two properties. And part of the way we could entice them to come is by agreeing to sign a long-term lease in their building to put City Hall. And we're gonna pay them rent, about a million dollars annually, to be located there. But because of that, we can free up the entire space that the existing City Hall is on We'll get brand new space. We'll be able to take city staff from different buildings and put it in a single floor so we're all together for a change. And then we're gonna be able to add park space where City Hall building is right now with a tree canopy. So you figure out little things. I, I read a, a quote from somebody and I'm, I'm not gonna say it right. There are connectors, Alex, all over the world. And if you look at things only from the connection of the dollar, you're gonna miss things. I got the county to, to agree to rebate taxes to this building for the first five years that they're here. Because right now the county's not collecting any taxes on that property, because that property is city owned property. We'll sell it to a developer, the county will make them whole because of the taxes, we'll pay them and they'll get finances because they've got a guaranteed tenant that's not going to walk away. And because of that, we're going to free up more property. So all of it is about just being strategic and finding out how this little piece interacts with this little piece and how this comes together. And all of a sudden, it doesn't cost you very much at all, right? Because I'm going to collect ad valorem taxes from the developer puts those buildings there. So he's going to pay me to pay him rent. Yeah. How beautiful is that? That's great. Right? And you're going to get some trees in the process. You got it. Uh, yeah, I just want to, uh, like, do, are there any other ecological concerns? I, so for us, we know, like, I, I, and going back to the cost, I guess, we know, and we run into this issue of um, people saying, like, it, I, it's been, like, glorified the dollar a tree. And when people say that it's 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 not that's that's not the cost of the tree because if you're seeding and you're throwing the trees 90 percent of those are going to die right they're saying like a million trees like 90 percent like it, it's really heartening to hear that you guys are taking the care and investing in, in the long-term goals of these trees it's it's really funny um alex because you know, I, I, I'm going to embarrass myself by saying you're much younger than I am, right? And you're going to live a lot longer probably than I will just because of that. But, and, and a lot of the things that I'm doing right now, I'm not even going to be able to really live to see come to full blossom, right? Because you know how long these trees take sometimes. And like you say, not all of them survive. But the reality is if we don't take the long game perspective, right? If we don't aim high in steering and always keep in mind what we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the very end of the baby boomers, right? And I carry a weight of shame that we didn't do a better job of taking care of the things that we were entrusted with, 
right? And I know that pattern started long before us because it started with the Industrial Revolution, but we didn't stop it. We didn't stop it. We kept building gas guzzling machines who we kept uh, thinking that bigger homes were better. We just weren't smart. And people are starting to change. Um, the question is gonna be, is that change gonna come in time? But those tree canopies, like you say, are gonna be an instrumental and critical piece of it because we're looking at a reality where that global warming is happening. And those trees give us life-sustaining shade and cool and oxygen because they're the replenishment of the very air we breathe. And we gotta treasure that. We gotta protect that. I don't believe in putting a price tag on that. You know, that's, that's just penny wise and pound foolish in my mind. Well, I think that's a wonderful legacy. Um, we, we, I was speaking with a volunteer. Um, we, we, we take like a lot of ours is community forestry. Uh, that's that's our that's our model is to is to get the community inspired to plant and one of our volunteers takes his grandson up to a spot and i i don't know if he's allowed to plant there but he, he has and uh he planted some coast live oaks which are a keystone species right. uh, for us and he takes his grandson up there to water and he goes these are your trees you are responsible for these trees <laughs> and i'm not gonna like Listen, they're they're still saplings, but you're the these will be that like you're gonna remember watering like I you're gonna need to take care of these trees long after I'm gone, and I just thought that was a the a, a beautiful, beautiful message. It is no question, no question. We've lost so much of that. We used to be an agrarian nature uh, nation, right? I mean, yeah. there used to be a consciousness about how important our land and our natural resources were. And we've moved so far away from that, it's shameful. Um, but we can get back there. Uh, we just have to be committed to doing it. And you know, like I say, it's small steps. Nobody's gonna change the whole world unless we do it collectively in a whole community of people willing to take small steps, right? I, I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you activate the community? Because I know a lot of it, I, I know you're, you're training people to, to where to plant, but are there any other steps you're taking to, to actually activate the community to like take care of the forest? Yeah. Like, I, the urban forest. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a tricky situation here because we are an urban setting, you know, um, yeah. and, and we don't have really large parks mm -hmm. by the time that the city, the city's fairly young. We're in our first 100 years. We won't have our centennial until the end of this decade. And so, and when the city began, we were primarily agriculture. Uh, this was where tomatoes were, uh, were uh, grown uh, and beans. Um, and then over time, uh, it blew up as sort of this warehouse district to the large sister city, Fort Lauderdale next door, because they only wanted nice things there because they were rich. And so they put all of their crap next door in what became Oakland Park, right? But what you do when you're dealing with people, especially people who don't have a lot, is that they're already primed to be excited and interested in what little they can add to what they have. And so it's easier for me, I think, to motivate the people in my city to get excited about a free tree and how to plant it and how to take care of it because, you know, trees cost money. And we work with them to try to encourage them to uh, utilize um, sustainable options uh, we don't use glyphosate anymore here in the city. And for a while that made people a little bit uncomfortable because they see some more weeds and the playing fields have some challenges and things of that nature. But that's about being conscious across the board and setting a standard so that people can understand why that's important and what it means. You know, a lot of the properties here are uh, littered with arsenic 
because arsenic was very commonly used as a, uh, a preventative weed killer hmm. for farmland and for other property, public property, golf courses, things like that. Um, and so we got a lot of cleaning up stuff to do. Um, and this, this partner of ours, the Urban uh, Farming Institute, has been really amazing too because we've given them community garden space in our parklands and they do a lot of training along with our horticulturalist to make sure that people understand. And we love little partnerships. You know, that nature trail that I had mentioned that we had added, those five acres that used to be an abandoned area of the school depot, bus depot. Um, last year in the middle of COVID, uh, we went through a really tough time. You know, Florida was one of the places that got hit and hit really hard. I mean, friggin' New York said that people from Florida couldn't come there anymore because we had so much COVID. And then they had like such a scourge, it was incredible. But during that time last June and July, uh, I had gotten together with uh, Fairchild uh, Botanical Garden in Miami. And they have a program underway to try to replenish the native species of orchids. And I said, look, how about this? I want to open up my nature trail for you to put in native orchids. And I'll buy those native orchids from you. And you help us teach people how to plant it. And we came up with an idea where we branded the program, the Parade of Orchids. And we said, help us put these orchids back as a remembrance of people who have helped you or your family during the COVID pandemic. And it became a $10,000 GoFundMe effort. And we're just shy of that total amount right now. And we're going to plant some two to 3,000 orchids throughout our nature trail. So then in two to three years, you're going to have these lovely little pieces of color. You know, that's, I know that's not a tree related item, but that's no, what we think here. It's item, like, though. yeah, right. And, and the related. reality is it builds consciousness in people's minds about how important it is to go back from a place that we used to be, you know? I, I well, get I, to do these fun things. You know, you guys yeah. and your parks and your great outdoors and stuff, and I'm sitting in this whole closed and horrible <laughs> office that it used to be a fire job. station. Yeah, let me tell you, I would give a lot to be with you right now. But yeah. the reality is, you know what? I get to do a really, a lot of really fun and really cool things. and. There are things that when I walk away from this, I'm going to be able to be proud of, you know? Um, and my team is amazing. You know, they're always coming up with inventive and, 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 and exciting ideas. Uh, I like to keep younger people around me because I think it keeps me focused, right, on things that are sometimes too easy for me to forget about, you know, like budgets and, and hiring and discipline and stuff. But we're off uh, the road, so there's a siren. No, no <laughs> issue. It happens all the time. So that's my story, my friend. Uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of how. Thank people... you so much for spending some time with us today. That was. Uh, that was no, it was my great it's pleasure. Closer and closer. <laughs> <laughs> Just so long. Oh, there's as a it's... fire. They, actually, our tree people. Uh, park like at Coldwater Canyon Park used to be an old fire station, and uh, and and they've actually they planted a lot of uh, they, they, what they thought were pretty were eucalyptus and a lot of uh, they planted yeah. a lot of redwoods and it's like it's great and we love them but those are not native species no 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 <laughs> not where you are no and it's 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 also very interesting that they planted those because it's like these are both uh, the eucalyptus at least are not great for fire. So it's just, it's interesting that the firefighters planted those. So huh. yeah, really? just a little little tidbit about us. <laughs> People aren't thinking through all of the decisions they make sometimes. Exactly, that's right? why it's important to plant native plants. Here, here, yeah. Well, David, okay. so lovely to meet you and thank hey, you for sharing all this. Let me tell you, uh, I'll leave this as a, as a thought for everybody is, you know, it's okay to start small. It's okay to do what you can. 
And it's okay to be proud of doing what you can, because each time you do that, you set an example for people who are going to see it and hear about it and think about it and say, you know what, I can do that too. And so you're going to proliferate a consciousness by engaging in a commitment to do whatever small thing it is you're going to do to help our world survive and get better. And together we can all get that done. I really believe it. We like to say, if you take care of one tree, you're, you're doing your job. Hallelujah, brother. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Hang in there. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Okay,